you know, listen, I'm, I'm running for governor. I'm not trying to be politically correct, and I won't be politically correct, but I'm about ready to say something that is going to maybe offend some people. But if I offend you, so what? Because there are municipalities that are struggling. The governor going to Puerto Rico is pure bullshit, okay? Bullshit. <laughs> Yes, we are in election fever full steam now. That was Governor Scott Wagner and his, like, you know, run for governor. It is Friday, September 7th, 2018. Welcome to Raging Chicken's Out the Coop podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Each week, I talk to our capital muckraker in chief, Sean Kitchen, about the good, the bad, and the ugly in state and national politics. This week's show... The steady state secret resistance starts to unfurl their plans. From the New York Times op-ed to the release of Bob Woodward's book Fear to the latest revelation that administration officials contacted a psychiatrist last year because Trump was scaring them. Oh, could this be the launch of Mike Pence 2020? Democrats, they steeled up for the Kavanaugh hearing. Know where the hell that came from? Been saving it up for a while, I guess. From Kamala Harris's brutal interrogations to Cory Booker and Maisie Hirono's releasing committee confidential emails, a designation which is basically doesn't mean anything, but that the GOP sought to keep those, those, those emails out of public view. Oh, it's been quite a ride this week. Booker broke the ice and now the docs are flowing. Leaked emails to the New York Times also show Kavanaugh thinks that Roe v. Wade is not settled law. Some pretty racist stuff in there, too. All this comes in the wake of the Trump Organization's decision to not release more than 100,000 documents from Kavanaugh's time serving as George W. Bush in the White House. And there's been nearly non-stop protests during the hearings. I've never seen anything like it. It's been freaking so heartwarming, I can't even tell you. New documents show the Trump Organization has cut climate change impacts from its energy plan. Remember those those things going on right now, too, as well. And as new wildfires rage in Northern California, the Delta Fire has now ravaged more than 15,000 acres of land and now threatens homes. The Village Voice, this is near and dear to my heart, the first alternative weekly in the nation shuts down completely after 63 years of providing all of us with joy and edge. Betsy DeVos moves to put the screws to Howard University by putting it on a heightened cash monitoring list. Right-wing billionaire founder of Amway, Richard DeVos, dies. Where have I heard that name before? Manafort's daughter files papers to change her name. (laughs) Get as far away from that ass as he can do. And Alex Jones, permanently banned from Twitter. Oh, it's so injustice. Gotta go to the bathhouse. In today's Pennsylvania Focus, Scott Wagner calls Tom Wolf's trip to Puerto Rico to help victims of Hurricane Maria pure bullshit. <laughs> As you heard. Republicans bring in the Koch brothers to launch their newest attack on public sector unions. And Dale and Leach is back in the news. Looks like all his efforts to redeem himself are not going so well. Following Pennsylvania's explosive report on sexual abuse by Catholic priests, New York and New Jersey join up and are ready to start their own investigations. And update in my neck of the woods. Lytle Hall Mold refuses eviction notice despite crews bleaching the walls. Smelled like a freaking pool when I went to work this week. KU history professor Mike Gambone, history professor and mold enthusiast, delivered moldy ceiling tiles to the administration. Because they said they didn't know anything about it, so I wanted to make sure that they knew about it. So we labeled them, room numbers, you know. In today's last call, Sean's going to Starfleet Academy. At least in today's last call, he knows nothing about this. <laughs> Elon Musk talks boring company while smoking some Mary Jane. <laughs> it all goes really well. Free Will's got a double can release tomorrow. Double can release of brand new beers. 
right? There's Brute. It's a Brute IPA. And Pink Guava Muse, right? That will be at both locations tomorrow. Pink Guava Muse is an imperial oat pale ale with milk sugar sugar and pink guava. Can't wait to try both of those. Uh, Four-pack, 16-ounce four-pack cans are available in both locations tomorrow. Want to remind everybody to tune in to the Rick Smith Show on Free Speech TV this and every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern. You can stream the show live at freespeech.org. You can also tune in the Dish Network, DirecTV, or through the Free Speech TV app on Roku. If you missed the show, go to ricksmithshow.com and click on the Free Speech TV icon in the sidebar. Or even better, go to freespeech.org and click on the Rick Smith Show in the archives and check them all out. Once again, I want to thank all of the people who've come out to support Raging Chicken Press over the years. Uh, we've, our members are what keeps us going. And we got to know that if we want a progressive future, we need progressive media. That's the bottom line. And as we kind of head into these midterm elections, like full throttle now and after Labor Day, uh, we're going to need it now more than ever. Become a member of Raging Chicken Press for as little as five bucks a month. Just go to patreon.com slash rcpress and choose your membership level. Not ready to become a member? No problem. Just go to ragingchickenpress.org and click on the big blue donate button in the right-hand sidebar. Right? We want to make sure to keep the, mood, the, uh, the movement in the media and the media in the movement. And you can do that by going to patreon.com slash rcpress and becoming a member today. This is just a kind of, uh, kind of, kind of house cleaning stuff. So I'll, thank you all of you who have been kind of moving over to um, Patreon. And thank you to our new members who have joined on Patreon. Um, just want to remind you, um, you might get emails, automated emails that come back, especially if you've changed your, um, your debit card, right? Or you changed your, um, how you're contributing. You've updated that, you know, every once in a while you have to kind of replace your cards. Um, if, you know, so if you get an automated thing, let you know that, um, uh, say with well, the payment or something hasn't gone through, that's where it's coming from. Um, so if you hear something from me, right, um, it's kind of, don't want to put pressure upon people, right? Um, but also want to let you know, make sure that, um, people have been like supporters for a long time time if there's an issue that ever comes up with a card um i'll email you um i've got a uh, back and forth with a couple of members about that before and we were able to kind of straighten out really quick right um just want to let you know right so uh sean here we are man another week another week full of bullshit <laughs> <coughs> well at least the last heat wave is uh snapped Oh my God! Well, for the moment, at least, I you know I'm not I'm not going to trust it until we're actually we actually hit the high of 60s during the day at this point. Well, that might happen on Sunday out here in Harrisburg. It's going to be like 65 and raining. So yeah, well, there's calling for that here too as well. So I mean, I I hope so, man. It's a, it's. I'm sit outside in a lawn chair and embrace it. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you gonna go down by the riverside, find your friend? Yeah, I'm going to look for Mark Price. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, my, I think my, Mark, kid, my kids actually had a uh, half day to, uh, yesterday because of the heat. Yeah, a lot of places have. I saw a picture of uh, a teacher posted from one of the Philadelphia schools where it was like already like 91 degrees in the classroom at like 8 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, it was, it was actually especially bad like the like the end of the second and then yesterday, the end of the second day and end of, the, end of yesterday just because the heat didn't dissipate overnight. So it was just kind of like, you know, once you start heating the building when the building's already at like 79 degrees at the beginning of the um, first part of the day when the sun comes up, you know, by 10 o'clock, it's in the 90s in the classroom. So crazy stuff, man. <clears throat> crazy stuff. And the Eagles won last night. Home opener. So that's always great. There you go. I was up to uh, till, uh, 1 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So uh, so your little... Uh... You little slow to go this morning? Is that what you're telling yeah. me? Yeah, I don't have anything. I don't, I don't have anything get me up like uh, Elon Musk. But Elon Musk, ah, the boring company was a joke. <laughs> we'll get to that in the, today's last call. Um, but the big stuff this week, right? What dominated the center of? Well, oh, first of all, a couple things, right? One, obviously, the Kavanaugh hearings that are going on right now um, are super serious, right? So that was kind of like the the block in the center of the week. But this has all been bracketed by um, the release of this New York Times op-ed um, that basically, you know, was a, the announcement of the secret society inside the White House that is tempting to thwart Trump. Right. So, I, I mean, I don't know if people if everybody has seen this, um, but, it, you know, it kind of I'm uh, sure like the QAnon fucking forums are just lit right now. Oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, last night, you know, I was like, I was going through some sound stuff for today's show, and uh, I was just kind of watching some news and things, and I, I was thinking, I was like, man, 
I would just love to just get into some, you know, just spend some time on Twitter, especially looking at some of the um, some of the right wing responses to this stuff, and then also in the Fortran stuff. But I'm like, I just I can't, man, because that's that's a hole that I'll just never get out of if I start. <laughs> You look up, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning. You're like, fuck, what did right. I do in my life? Exactly, exactly, <laughs> right. Which is basically what that Fortran is, right? <laughs> it's like <laughs> asking that question to yourself every single day over and You're over. You're going down the rabbit hole. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, go for it, Alice. Um, <clears throat> but so, yeah, so the so New York Times op-ed. So, okay, if by any chance, if you have not heard about what this op-ed was, Right. Um, basically you've been living under a rock. Right. You've been living under a rock. Right. And look, that's understandable to some degree. Right. I want to kind of be clear about that, um, because um, there's good reason these days to like want to live under a rock. Right. And just kind of like say, oh, my God, just let this pass by. But it was pretty crazy. Right. Um, so, I mean, it's basically New York Times does not normally publish op-eds that are um, anonymous, but this one was. The person who wrote this was um, claiming to be a, a senior Trump administration official. And uh, the New York Times editorial board has a big little uh, kind of, you know, prologue, basically, to the letter saying, look, we don't normally do this, um, but the identity of this person is known to us. And basically, we can confirm that this is a senior Trump administration official. And, um, you know, basically what they're doing is saying, hey... Uh, Trump, not competent, right? He's doing some things that are very, very bad, but in like an Obama-esque fashion, except with like secret society kind of night goggles and shit on. They're like, we got this. Don't worry, right? Um, I mean, that was basically the thrust of it. It's like a, uh, I mean, it's like almost like a slow motion coup attempt. <laughs> and then that with like the Woodward book, it's coming out. Right, <clears throat> Right. So I mean I like I like the way you frame that like in terms of, like the slow motion coup, right? Cuz that's that is the way this thing feels. Which is not good for democracy. No, it's not good for democracy. So let's like you know, let let's look at you know, you can't read that thing, right? So let me just I'll give you just a little bit of a flavor just in case you haven't got it, right? So the title of it first of all is I am part of the resistance inside the Trump administration, right? You can already say, you know, Cut to scene of blackened White House building rummaging through desk drawers in the Oval Office, right? I mean, it's like that kind of stuff. It's all this cloak and dagger stuff. The New York Times publishes this with, like, the picture. It's a, it's a, a black and yellow graphic, right, with a map of the United States all kind of, like, tied up, um, teetering on the edge of a cliff, balancing on the point of Texas um, with four people holding the rope and preventing it from going over the edge, Right. So that, that's I mean, and that's pretty a good graphic, I think, for how this uh, how the the writer of the op ed wants you to think about um, these people. They are the only thing standing like between complete collapse. Right. Um, and normality. Like, that's it. Right. And it's just like what we were talking about before the beginning of the, uh, the podcast. It's like uh, they're, they're, they're getting ready for uh, shit hits the fan when the midterm elections come because they're expecting to lose the house and then you're going to have the subpoenas just coming in from all the different committee hearings right and stuff like that so right so i mean there's definitely i mean there's a lot of stuff going on so let's so let's, like here's a little piece of so from the white house to the executive branch departments and agencies right well you talk some, they, they talk about this this there's this like two track presidency right from the white house to executive branch departments and agencies senior officials will privately admit their daily disbelief at the commander in chief's comments and actions most are working to insulate their operations from his whims meetings with him veer off topic and off the rails. He engages in repetitive rants, and his impulsiveness results in half-baked, ill-informed, and occasionally reckless decision decisions that have to be walked back. Quote, there is literally, literally no telling whether he might change his mind from one minute to the next, a top official complained to me recently, exasperated by an Oval Office meeting in which the president flip-flopped on a major policy decision he'd made only a week before. The erratic behavior would, could be more concerning, would be more concerning if it weren't for unsung heroes in and around the White House. Some of his aides have been cast as villains by the media, but in private... They have gone to great lengths to keep bad decisions contained to the West Wing, though they are clearly not always successful. Some of the contagions leak out, <laughs> right? I mean, that's it. I mean, come on. I, this is so freaking over the top, right? And I, I got two tracks on this. One, what, what you just already mentioned, right? The one track of this is like, if this is going on, like, and look, I, frankly, I, I could totally see this happening. 
right? And and Bob Woodward's book you started to mention there. My guess is the same people that are behind writing this op-ed are the ones that are being interviewed, like the unnamed sources that are being interviewed by in Bob Woodward's book, right? Saying things like, um, there were you know former officials that have left, right? Who you know Trump signed this you know signed this thing uh, uh, with North North Korea, and they had to sneak in his office and swipe it off his desk desk so it wouldn't go into law. That he's being prevented from seeing certain information, right? They're kind of filtering stuff off and kind of like handling things behind this. John so, Kelly saying like this is the worst fucking job he's ever taken in his life. Yeah, right. The freaking crazy house, right? With <laughs> another official, right? So all this stuff that's going on. And if okay, if you, you, you like, you pull back a little bit, you get away from like Trump the celebrity, right? That that everybody was, is paying attention to. You got you say this is really freaking nuts, right? In terms of what is actually happening in terms of the structures of our democratic institutions, like these people want to want us to see them as heroes, preventing us from the Trump destruction. But essentially, what they're doing, right, is they are circumventing the way that our government is supposed to work, right? Now, you might argue, you could say, that, oh, well, well, thank God, right? Otherwise, we would have already had a nuclear strike against North Korea, for example. Right? I'm just making that up as an example. Or we would have assassinated Assad. Or we would have assassinated Assad, or who knows how many other people, right? I mean, all that kind of stuff is getting played out. And you could say, well, okay, thank God for these folks. But that gets dangerously close right, to, like... Especially if you think about who are some of his senior advisors, like generals, right? And the guy picked from God, Mike Pence, right? <laughs> this is this is this is not um, uh, uh, the greatest scenario. No, and then uh, it, it's like uh, you know I was thinking about this this week. You know, it's like we're, we're, we are literally becoming like Turkey, or like some other <clears throat> despotic states that have still have like somewhat freedoms and all but you know we're we're we're, we're going down that path of like <laughs> yeah no that's right but like <laughs> so here's a this is the kind of thing that we did so i you know i teach this class called activist writing media and you know, as part of the class we pull out you know kind of examples of things that are happening in the news we cut for analysis think about framing a whole bunch of other kind of stuff and so we went through this one I went through this one um, um, yesterday in my class, kind of talk about what was happening here. Because here's, the, here's one of the problems, right? Now, we've talked about on this show about how the Democrats focus on, like, you know, Trump bad man, right, as the rallying cry for the resistance, right, about the ways that everything is about Trump policies. Everything is the way of what Donald Trump is doing and not really spending enough time with the focus on the Republican Party, right, on, like, uh, Paul Ryan, about Mitch McConnell, about all the people who are actually authoring the worst policies and ushering them through and have not done anything, right, to prevent what's happening at the craziness in the kind of Trump White House, right? And so what we're being asked to do again is focus only on Trump and his behavior, Right. Because even in that New York Times op ed. Right. Um, these are folks that are saying, look, we are not the resistance of the left. Hell no. Right. Matter of fact, we like, you know, all the things that are important to um, um, to the Republicans. Right. We like, you know, free minds, free thinking, free markets. Right. And right. There's some good things have come out during the Trump administration, despite his erraticness, like historic tax reform, like more money to the military, right? And all these things that have been on the Republican wish list for a long time. So, hey, it's not all bad, but we just don't want, you know, the, the, the kind of like that guy sitting at our dinner table disrupting our Thanksgiving dinner anymore, right? We've got what we need passed and everything. He proved his usefulness to us, and now we're going to start the move to, um, to move him away. And, I, you know, again, I have no basis for this other than kind of, you know, everything's I'm reading. There's all such a cool analysis trying to figure out who this person is. And there's some people pointing to Mike Pence based upon some of the word choices that are in the um, um, that are in um, the op ed. But whatever. I mean, I do think this is like the beginning to rally behind um, the transition to a Mike, Pre uh, a Mike Pence presidency. Right. That's the way I look at it. Right. Because these folks are going to say, who's the person that's going to step up? Either they're going to try to force Trump out, right? And in other words, to kind of like get him to resign because he can't take it anymore, 
right? Um, or um, there, if they really are going to think about letting the Democrats pull the trigger on impeachment, let the Democrats do the dirty work, and then Mike Pence rises um, to take over Donald Trump's seat. Right? I think that's why you also get the big appeal in the New York Times article right, for this rallying cry, we're all in this together as Americans. Yeah, and, and like the, the audience is not uh, the conservative movement here. No, no. I mean, you're not going to the New York Times to speak to the conservative movement. You're going to the New York Times to speak to your well-meaning liberals and the people who... Chuck the Demo- Schumer, for example. Yeah. <laughs> like, And the people who Hillary Clinton tried to get the vote for, but never actually voted for her in, in, in the general. Exactly. I think that's totally what this is a play for. Right. And now that doesn't mean there hasn't been real consequences in the Tripe White House. Like there's some, there's some tape that was like leaked. Right. Like after he was first when he was first told about the New York Times op-ed because he doesn't read the shit. Right. But if someone first <laughs> come in and kind of told him about it, like this is what happened. That's why I prefer <laughs> the understanders I prefer. Right, and then the person gets kicked out of the room, so you can't hear the rest of it. But uh, you know, it was it was apparently a real tirade. <laughs> <laughs> and then he sent everyone to the gulags for their uh, for their um, the lie detector tests. Yeah, well, that's been crazy, right? Well, I mean, Trump's immediate response was like, you know, of course, it goes to Twitter and all this stuff, basically he's calling this person like, you know, committed treason, right? Saying that they're cowards, that they should come out of the, you know, come out and show themselves, right? And that we should, you know, there's been some suggestions that you start subjecting the senior staff to lie detector tests, right? Which is just kind of like, it's like, you know, again, if it were a book. This would be like, so like, are, are you going to like, are you, is this going to be like the type of thing like where a van pulls up outside their, their, their apartment <laughs> and like the door opens up, two people come out, put a black bag over their face and just like throw them in the va- and take them to some like secret like prison and then like just start like interrogating them like with, with like truth serum and a lie detector. Totally. Like, totally. This is like, well, have you ever seen, okay. So you ever seen like, okay, there's like in New York City especially, right, when when uh, when the Russian mob started pulling in, right, I, I think like Trump's like on the phone with Putin, right, kind of like, I need your guys now. Now I need your guys. <laughs> right? You've got to sit there. Because like the Russian mob was like, you know, you have the, like the Italian mob, right, and the Irish mob that have been around for a long time. And they've got a kind of like like old country style way of, of handling stuff, right? You know, the, uh, you, you, unfortunately, you've crossed me here, and I'm, it's, it's just business, right? This is just business. Boom, right? You put them down, right? <laughs> the Russian mob, right, are paramilitaries, right? So all the, rep- rep- you know, you, representation. KGB. Right, and you see, yeah. like, they were famous for, like, coming ar- driving around in these, like, black panel vans, Right. With all the windows blacked out and kind of, you know, pulling over to the side instead of like being like the guy like, yeah, you know, we've uncovered what uh, what you've been doing and you, you crossed us for the loss last time. No, they get out and they are full in full paramilitary gear with body body armor and automatic weapons. Right. And they come out as an assault team and fucking drag them into the uh, drag them into the van and kind of pull. And it all, happen, all happens within like five seconds. Totally. Right. So and I think like in, in the Trump's mind, I think that's what he's looking for. He's probably been on, on the phone like, Stephen, Stephen Seagal, is this you? Right. I know you're not going to be let back into the country because the way that you treat 12 year old girls. But uh, I could really use your help. <laughs> right? I mean, <clears throat> But it's cra- no, and you can imagine what's going on, and I really think that's the, that that this is the coordinated effort that's going on right now, right? And then like the uh, the, the, no, the other thing is like the audio that was released with the Woodward interview. The that was just I listened to that earlier this week, and he's like Trump's just befuddled. Like, what? What do you mean, Kellyanne didn't like you? You, you told Kellyanne. Like Kellyanne didn't tell me. He's like, like, you know, he's like, even he's like, in the future, you, know, you should t- tell Kellyanne, right? And uh, um, so he, he's like, Trump's yeah, like, I did. Who did you talk to? He's like, uh, Kellyanne. <laughs> <laughs> I tried six times and uh, talked to her a couple times, and uh, he's like, really, I didn't. Tell- I'm sorry, we couldn't do oh, this. She didn't tell me about this book that was coming out. <laughs> right, exactly. So, like, again, you got to wonder, right? You got to wonder. Or she told him, and he just fucking forgot because he's a dementia patient. Well, you got three he- options, right? <laughs> Option number one. Right. That like uh, sh- that Trump's just lying. Right. That he that he just did, you know, was refusing that kind of stuff. And he's trying to play nice. Right. He's trying, just just for manipulative purposes. Right. With Bob Woodward on the phone. Right. Again, that's that's very, very plausible. Right. Number two is that uh, Kellyanne Conway 
other folks did tell him that he should talk to Bob, Bob Woodward because he's doing this book and Trump just blew it off or kind of forgot about it, whatever like that. Or number three, they really didn't tell him. <laughs> right. Because they know he's not going to be like, you know, like reading, like looking for upcoming books. He's not going to be following like real news. Right. He's going to do Fox and Friends and he's going to be Sean Hannity and that's it. So they're not going to be necessarily kind of like talking about what's at stake here and all this stuff. So, you know, who knows? And either in any of those scenarios, none of them are good. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I just think that, look, <laughs> the target right now, we're going to see that. I was saying this to Sean before the uh, uh, before we got on today and started, started recording. I really think that, look, this is all being set up for like day one of the uh, after the midterms. Right. This is going to be the play that these kind of like, um, you know, they just throw him off on the side of the road. <laughs> Well, or just let him continue to make a mess, right, while slowly some of these kind of like emerging leaders, right, the moral compass of the Republican Party steps forward to also denounce Trump because then they got a two year window. Right. They've got a two year window where they can decide, is it to their advantage to, uh, um, you know, is it to their advantage to uh, basically try to get rid of him? Right. Um, or just to kind of let him be there and let the Democrats focus solely on Donald Trump. Right. So I think that the the the, the odds are right. And somebody's making this making this bet that the, that's what the Democrats will do that under the leadership of Chuck Schumer, especially if they take the Senate, um, which which is again not necessarily um in the cards but if they took the senate um they're they're positioning it forth that let the democrats run with this stuff like the democrats will probably take the house and then we're going to have all these hearings and all this other kind of stuff and again they're gonna let the democrats have at it and there's gonna be all this muckety muck going and then slowly but surely you're gonna have people like mike pence and then you're gonna have some other republican leaders jeff flake will probably kind of re-emerge from whatever after you know getting re-embalmed and coming back out and saying like oh, yes i'm from the outside here's what it is you're gonna have the reasonable republicans moving forward for 2020 i mean i think that's the play that we've got going on right now yeah <clears throat> crazy so that's yeah that was just like wow <laughs> a wow week um and then at the same time that that's going on, you had like, I mean, I got to say, it was probably the best Supreme Court hearing I have ever watched. I didn't watch absolutely all of it, but holy moly, man, the, the Democrats were steeled up for this stuff. And then you've had like nonstop protests disrupting um, the hearings. Unbelievable. Yeah, no, it was really um, interesting uh, watching uh you know, um, Kamala Harris, uh, Cory Booker, um, them two, who are more of the moderates or more like the centrists in, in, in the party or not like the most progressive people in the party uh, actually start speaking out on this, on, on these issues. Um, you know, especially what happened after last week with Schumer uh, deciding to uh, deciding to skip town and give uh, Reid all of his uh, all, all of his votes, the nothing burger and for that nothing burger in return. Yeah. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we get to leave town, so you get the 15, uh, 15 justices approved, right? And like we talked about last week on the podcast, now one in seven of federal court justices at district or the appeals level or something like this uh, are, are Trump appointees, right? Uh, thanks to the kind of, uh, you know, hey, let's rush all through these appointments so we can get home. Yeah. So, but one of the things that uh, became really interesting this week was what um, Kavanaugh had to say about Roe v. Wade. Mm-hmm. Not only Roe v. Wade, but saying that um, calling contraception, birth control, abortion medication. I think that's one of the most concerning things coming out of this. Um, you know, like it's we're 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 going to see a complete rollback of reproductive rights in this country on the federal level. And it's going to be the type of thing where it's like I never thought we were going to get to this point. But, you know, it, again, elections have consequences here. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, look, and one of the one of the important things about about first Cory Booker. Right. I mean, you know, again, look, all props in the world to Cory Booker for doing this. Right. For kind of leading the charge and doing his like I am Spartacus moment. Right. Um, but basically saying, look, look, I understand that, you know, I'm breaking potentially breaking Senate rules and that, that uh, this may have consequences about, you know, kicking me out of the Senate. But you know what? <clears throat> um, I people have to know that there's you have completely like blocked off um, any potential damaging um, 
um, kind of like emails or documents um, about Kavanaugh and his time in the, in the government um, to the point where the American people are not allowed to see this. So I'm releasing this. Right. And the fact that they threw down the gauntlet and basically said, go ahead. Right. I mean, again, it's a nice little campaign move, too. Right. I mean, go ahead. Kick me out of the Senate. <laughs> right. Like say hello to uh, President Booker. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but so you've got you got that thing. And and then, you know, Maisie Hirono basically jumping on board and saying, OK, yep. Just like Cory Booker, he did this. I'm releasing these other things, too, as well, when it comes to um, the what Kavanaugh has said in the back uh, before about race. Right. In particular, about native tribes um, and, and kind of like an indigenous uh, Hawaiians. And that's been that was absolutely, absolutely fascinating. And, you know. By breaking through there and basically laying down the challenge to, s- to telling back to Chuck Grassley, who's kind of you know the uh, Republican who's running this um, these hearings, saying like I I beg you to show everybody why this is confidential because remember it's not confidential in terms of like national security classifications it's committee confidential which means Chuck Grassley basically said no we don't want people looking at this stuff right and they basically said the challenge here you go show. Tell everybody why we can't see this. What is the threat to national security here? And there's nothing. It's only about what would have been damaging um, to the hearings and damaging to um, um, a a smooth sail for Kavanaugh. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is I mean, as I said earlier, uh, and I'll say it again, we are becoming Turkey and it's just happening right right before us. I mean, you're going to have an illegitimate Supreme Court uh, nominee make it to the bench who is completely against uh the you know women's uh reproductive rights who is uh completely for uh the president breaking the law thinking that he's above the law and the president cannot get indicted on crimes um and that you know this is this is this, this is really dangerous yes i mean like um i mean are we going to like depend upon john roberts uh making sure contraception stays legal in this country like, th- like, imagine how far down this rabbit hole we can go. Right. Exactly. Uh, not only will abortion be outlawed, and but we're making a states' rights issue again, and you know, re- repealing that. But imagine making contraception, birth control, um, a states' rights issue. Right. Exactly. I mean that that's pretty fucked up. No, I'm telling you, it's like you know, I look at this like I was thinking about this the other day. It's like you know, you've got Kavanaugh. Uh, what this would do, and if you look at now some of the emails that were uh, released about what he's what he said in the past about Roe v. Wade, and actually in the questioning during the hearing, what was it, again? This is this is the stuff that this is the kind of thing that gets me to piss. Look, no, every, you got to go all in on this, right? I mean, forget any potential kind of codes of civility in the Senate for this, because when when Kavanaugh was asked questions specifically about the um, about Roe v. Wade is settled law, right um, in there, especially under questioning for Kamala Harris. Right. Um, but basically what he was saying, he was like, as a court, as in the courts, this is settled law. What he was what he was not saying, however, was saying that what does that mean? He's like, as a justice, I have to follow precedent. And this is settled law as a court. But what he said in his emails is that, yes, that is true, except if you're at the Supreme Court level. At the Supreme Court level, you can overturn precedent and it is not settled law at that point. Right. And so he was choosing his words so carefully to make sure that he was not going to perjure himself. Right. Or kind of like give him, make himself a hypocrite by saying that, no, it's set a law by talking about the rules of of uh, the rules that judges are supposedly bound for um, up to the Supreme Court. But when it gets to the Supreme Court, he would not talk about his time in the Supreme Court and what what he would do. And that being kind of non precedent, right, that he would be happy to overturn it at that point. So when you have someone who's that calculating moving forward, right, as as he's pretending to be stupid, right, um, he's not. He's a political calculator. Um, a, a, you know that that is should be concerning to every single person in the room. Yeah. Crazy man. Well, and I also got to say, man, the protests have been unbelievable. Yes, uh, some people I know personally were down there getting arrested uh, from the local indivisible groups. Um, Jane Palmer, uh, Kadita Kenner, who works for Why Courts Matter. Um, that's a project that's uh, working with uh, the Keystone Budget Policy Center. 
um, and a bunch of other people from the Indivisible Philadelphia, and a lot of people who got arrested in D.C. last year uh, when they were trying to roll back the um, Affordable Care Act. Well, there you have it. Like, uh, little did I know that some of the people getting dragged out that I was watching on thing were actually people right here from our own backyard. Yes. So kudos um, to all of you, um, you know, both from Pennsylvania, from around the country um, who were there um, and who have shown that, no, we will not consent. Yeah. So. Oh, man. So you got a potential. And, you know, and again, there's a real question, too, as well, about whether this is going to have um, whether the, this will prevent a confirmation of Kavanaugh. Um, and, and like you said, if, if they push forward for, for this and they confirm Kavanaugh, right, first of all, Susan Collins is freaking basically exposed herself to be a complete liar. Um, I mean, I mean, not that, you know, we would have thought otherwise, right. Um, and same thing with, um, what's her face? Um, Alaska, why am I blanking on her name? Anyways, but- Senate, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Murkowski, right? Um, Senator Murkowski from Alaska, um, who basically basically said, no, as long as this is settled law from Roe v. Wade, um, that's it. So, cool. Sean enjoyed the fact that I couldn't remember her name. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> laughing at something that just got sent to me by a... Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, by... Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah. It's something I got to say for the next segment. Uh, okay. It has to deal with a... Um, with this really big fucking douchebag who works with the Wagner campaign. It's a civility troll on Twitter. Oh, awesome. I'll preface it with that. <laughs> okay. All right. There you go. Stay tuned for part two, folks. <laughs> Pen- yeah, focus. Well, yeah. So that was the kind of main stuff in here. But I want to, I do want to run through a couple things for, um, of, that have happened throughout the week that have not been on the front pages everywhere. Um, now if you remember, we talked about this before is that um, the Obama put forward the clean energy plan. And uh, again, all sorts of issues with that, right? All sorts of problems with um, um, what Obama said didn't go far enough. All that kind of stuff. Granted, granted, granted. But the uh, Trump administration basically um, just um, removed uh, the climate impacts for the study. So, for example, um, a draft version of the proposal, and this um, was released Friday, reveals the Trump administration has removed mentions of climate science that were included in earlier iterations of the plan. The previous draft sent to the Office of Management and Budget in July included phrases like global average surface temperatures, sea level rise, and the burning of fossil fuels in its impact analysis. By August, those sections, hundreds of words that warned, uh, that warned of the growing threat to climate change were cut from the final 289-page analysis. Right. Um, And so basically what they did is they had this initiative that came forward. Right. And they had a little bit of a of a PR uh, push on it and said, no, look, this stuff is in here that people who worry that this is going to, you know, denying a science. They're just kind of being overblown and they're playing politics. And then when the spotlight goes away. Right. They revise the draft and they remove science. Right. um, From the kind of the impact analysis. So in other words, there's no way you can measure. There's nothing to hold um, um, businesses um, accountable. There's no way to actually say that, hey, we are going to rely upon measurements of CO2 in the atmosphere and about the pollutants that are put in the atmosphere in order to kind of um, ensure that we're not going to be contributing to global warming. Nope. Um, they've taken those things off. Right? And this is the kind of stuff that is happening um, that would normally be pretty huge news. Um, it just completely buried this kind of week under, under, you know, again, for reasons understandable. And I think that the fact that they did that at the same time that we see um, a brand new massive wildfire um, roaring out in Northern California um, is is something else. I mean, it's already burned uh, 15,000 acres of land, and now it's kind of moving through. And this is actually not far from where the car fire was. If you remember that, that was kind of one of the other massive fires earlier in the summer. Um, And now here here we are once again with another massive wildfire, which is, again, um, you know, window into our climate future so that's pretty bad stuff um the one of the things i'm again these are these are things that are are are, are so granular but whatever betsy devos basically put the screws to howard university this week and so there's a classification basically that um is called heightened cash monitoring it's this list right and when you have heightened cash monitoring you're basically the they the government 
makes you go through and basically prove where every single penny that you're spending goes, right? It's a huge administrative burden. Now, Howard University, right, is probably like the nation's most storied um, 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 historically black, black college and yeah, university, yeah. right? HBCU, right? And it's, you know, you have major leaders that come out of Howard University. It's, uh, it's in Washington, D.C., um, and it has been facing budget issues, right, um, for a variety of different issues, right, or, or, or different reasons. And this is not, like, unlike a lot of other college universities across the country, right? So all kind of grappling with those, um, you know, the rising costs of higher education, as you always hear this kind of stuff. Plus, you always wonder what's happening with kind of the administrations. And, but, you know, we'll go beyond. We we'll, won't get into all that detail. But basically, so what this does is this puts a huge additional administrative burden upon Howard University. So instead of there being, you know, ability to hire more faculty members um, to ensure that education is delivered like this, now they're going to have more resources that are going to be going towards the administration just to produce these reports. And then what will happen is federal funds are going to be withheld um, until these until they get these clearances. Now, the, the vast majority of students who go to Howard University are also on federal financial aid, and this potentially puts their financial aid in jeopardy, right? So here you go. It's like, again, Betsy DeVos going after Howard University in the nation capital, right? A historically black college university, right? Um, and one of the most storied ones in the country um, as a way of just kind of putting them under additional financial pressure, right? And you got to wonder what the end game is there, right? So... That's to pay attention to. And, uh, yeah, her father-in-law died, right? The billionaire right-wing nut job who helped fund half of the crap that we see today, right? Um, and she married into, but <clears throat> whatever. Um, other kind of stuff is um, just kind of funny stuff. Manafort's daughter, <laughs> right? She's, like, changing her name. Right. Uh, she's actually taken on her mother's maiden name. She's a documentary filmmaker. And uh, she's basically she calls herself like, you know, she's an out and out liberal. Right. And she's basically this was the final straw. She's like, that's it. I'm not just going to use, uh, you know, um, use my state, my professional name just for my films. I'm actually going to officially change this to distance myself from this guy. So I'm like, kudos to her. That was one of those moments. Um, and uh, Alex Jones. Right. Had a bad week. Right, uh, he's uh, he uh, he he got in there with uh, with Marco Rubio, and then uh, got banned from Twitter. <laughs> right, that was pretty pretty crazy. That <clears throat> yeah, that was also when he was like <laughs> fucking with Rubio online. Yeah, that was that was hilarious, man. I mean, I gotta say that his like uh, <laughs> you can just see like Rubio just getting pissed off in this interview. <laughs> All right, time to go back to the bathhouse. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I mean, I, I don't know how, frankly, I don't know how Rubio kept his composure in the interview. So basically, if you haven't seen the video yet, is that Rubio is getting interviewed um, for, you know, kind of like legitimate media sources, right, about whatever. And uh, again, by me saying this, I am not therefore saying Marco Rubio is a good man. <laughs> Right. Just so we're clear is that we can go bigger than the on off either or pro con world. Right. Um, so I'm not trying to champion Rubio, but it was kind of I know how we kept his composure. I'll never know because you have Alex Jones is like literally barking at him from the sideline. Right. It's just freaking hilarious. But whatever. Um So, yeah, so that's just the kind of fun stuff here. The last thing I want to mention before we go to break is um, the village voice. Right. And uh, this was sad for me for 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 a whole lot of reasons, right? I remember Village Voice was probably one of the first um, kind of alternative media sources that I've ever, that I ever um, encountered um, where you had just amazing reporting, kind of, you know, you know the, the, the amazing reporting, investigative work, um, coverage of culture and kind of the edges of culture that you'd never see um, in, in covered any other place, right? And it was kind of focused on New York City. Uh, when I got to college at one point, actually, um, a couple of friends of mine and I chipped in and we actually subscribed to it. Um, so we used to get it, at, get it at college. And Village Voice was just so freaking awesome. And it's, it's another example of what is happening in today's journalism world, right? So the Village Voice like every newspaper um, was having, was having difficulties. Right. And um, it stopped publishing what about a year ago or so it stopped publishing in print. And um, it was bought out by this guy, Peter Barbie. And he's like a billionaire. Right. So he bought the thing out and uh, he promised that he was going to turn into this digital powerhouse and so on. Um, but then he just this past week, he basically cited business realities in a statement to his staff about why he has to close the newspaper down. Um, it, it's kind of disgusting 
because uh, what it takes to actually run the Village Voice um, is not extensive. This guy basically could have like given his pocket change to keep this thing going um, and, and to support it until we're kind of like you know having emergent models of um, alternative journalism. But instead, they're shutting it down. Right? It was the biggest alt weekly. It was the first alt weekly in the in the country, um, and uh, we get to say goodbye to it now. And this is the, true the kind of stuff where you know. The, there are no other models to what um, is going to s- kind of save journalism. And right now, like we've said a thousand times before, Raging Chicken Press and other publications like ours, other podcasts like ours, um, most of that is done on a voluntary basis, <laughs> right? We are not, especially those of us who are saying that, look, we need to have this kind of alternative media, not just in New York City and Los Angeles and Miami and the kind of big cities in Chicago, not just that, but we need to have this in places like where we are here in Pennsylvania, in Harrisburg, right, in Eastern PA and Pittsburgh, uh, where we're covering things that are happening on the ground every day. We need to build that from the ground up. Um, but the fact, the fact of the matter is you get away from the major media markets, right? Once you get outside of Philadelphia, outside of New York, outside of Chicago, right, um, people don't generally want to kind of support you, right? Um, and then so if, you know, if we see that something like the Village Voice is going um, bottoms up, um, we got to really double down, right, and make sure that we're supporting um, our media. And, yes, that is a shameless plug for you to become a member of Raging Chicken Press by going to patreon.com slash rcpress and become a member for as little as 5 bucks a month. Um, but it's also something bigger than that. It's also saying that, look, we have to kind of think long-term and think about politically about investing in the institutions of struggle and the institutions of the movement, right, not just politicians, Right. But into the everyday work, the things that we need to support political movements. Um, And if we expect there to be the media and the kind of cutting media and the kind of like muckraking that Sean does, if we expect that to continue, um, we got to pony up and we got to step up and we got to say, hey, I'm going to support Raging Chicken Press. Anyways, this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. When we come back, we're going to get into the wonderful world of Wagner's. (laughs) Right back. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 2011. That was the day hundreds of ILWU strikers blocked railroad tracks near Longview, Washington. They hoped to stop grain shipments from moving in and out of the EGT grain terminal. Longshoremen had been sitting down on the tracks throughout the summer, resulting in over 100 arrests. No trains had moved in or out of the terminal since July. But then a federal judge issued an injunction against ILWU pickets. The BNSF Railroad tried to move grain once again. ILWU picketers in Vancouver were able to hold off the train until police forcibly dispersed the crowd. Then, hundreds gathered at Longview to block the train from coming in. That's when police went on the offensive. They used clubs and pepper spray against the longshoremen, arresting 19. They threw ILWU President Bob McElrath to the ground. Rumors spread that police had broken his arm. Hundreds of regional longshoremen rushed to Longview. The Seattle and Tacoma ports shut down in protest. The next morning, 10,000 tons of grain were opened onto the railroad tracks. The grain export terminal was the first to be built in the Pacific Northwest in almost 30 years. EGT hoped to undercut the powerful ILWU, who controlled operations at the port since its founding in the 1930s. The union refused to agree to work 12-hour shifts at straight time. The EGT hoped to break the hiring hall by refusing to recognize maintenance and inside workers at the terminal. They then attempted to fill jobs with workers from the operating engineers. But the ILWU persevered. By the end of January, EGT had backed off many of its demands, negotiations resumed, and days later, the contract was signed. Welcome back to Raging Chickens Out the Coop podcast. And there is breaking news, everyone. <laughs> breaking news right here as we are recording this. Sean was nearly off his chair during the end of the last segment. Sean, update us on the latest news. All right. So <laughs> there's this uh, consultant in Harrisburg named Ray Zborny who uh, is a big fucking asshole and is <laughs> yelling at me for being uncivil at times on Twitter. And um, yesterday... 
he sent a um, he sent out a text message uh, to Jason High, Wagner's campaign manager, uh, Janice Harris, his finance director, uh, Shauna Bacos, I can't pronounce her last name, policy director, and to Billy Penn reporter Max Marin. He wasn't supposed to get the text message. Ah, um, it's, so let me guess. As a reporter who receives this message, he might have written something about it. <laughs> yes. So the meme that he sent in the text message was a picture of Caitlyn Jenner. Uh, it said, uh, believe in something, even if it means cutting your dick off. Boom. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, so this is, of course, of his takeoff on that new Nike ad, right? With yes. the Colin uh, Kaepernick, right? So here you go. Yeah. And Zaborny uh, represents... Uh, represented the uh, human rights campaign at one point has done LGBTQ work in uh, Harrisburg in Harrisburg as lobbyist, and so um, so so Max also published the text thread. It goes, uh, "Hey Max, sorry about the last text. I obviously was sending it to a friend of mine with a similar number. By the way, did you hear back from the Wagner folks? <laughs> LOL, I did hear back. They're uh, being cagey about the ad buys in Philly and won't." It won't provide even basic spending numbers that they'll have to report for the cycle anyway. Um, and Matt, or he goes, uh, and then Zaborty goes, I'll see if I can get them to give you something, a little more on the background. Let's just forget I sent that meme, smiley face. <laughs> Max replies, I would greatly appreciate that on background, and uh, we can consider the meme forgotten. And then Zaborny says, let me track down. So, uh, and, uh, yeah, so the meme was forgotten about and published into the annals of Billy Penn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's so, pretty uh, huge. So that's a that's a pretty good, uh, I think, lead-in uh, to this week in Wagner, especially after, like, Wagner had all those comments about, you know, male plumbing. You know, if you got male plumbing, you're a guy. You know? Yeah, and also... Uh, <laughs> This is just like, um, like this. This is just this is like, this is a campaign of like unforced errors and like, like just tripping over their uh, no pun intended dick. But yeah. <laughs> like, I think Zaborny said uh, really stay anyone questioning my commitment to, to diversity or the LGBTQ community obviously doesn't know me very well. Looks like it. <laughs> they obviously don't know you that well if you're going to be sending that type of shit around to a fucking racist and transphobic and homophobic uh, campaign. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, I, I don't even know. Like, I, I don't even know how his comment makes sense. Anybody who knows me knows that that I would never send a meme like this, even though I just I, sent it. I, I, would, I would just do it. <laughs> I don't make racist jokes in public, okay? I only do them with my friends in private. Exactly. But no one does. No, no, no one. If, you know, everyone knows I'm really good on the equality thing. Yeah. So you know, if you if you are like arguing for equality, I'd happily take your money and kind of do communication stuff for you, right? But you know, when I clock out, I'm freaking bringing up the Caitlyn Jenner memes, man, all over <laughs> the place. So there's actually a funny thing. Um, you remember when uh, Corbett? was making the transphobic and homophobic remarks yeah. back when he was governor about same-sex marriage and how it's relatable to incest and stuff like this. Yes. Uh, this is when Zaborny uh, was repping some of these groups. And um, when they released their endorsements, because, like, Zaborny, um, Zaborny, uh, you know, yeah, uh, <laughs> like, was saying, like, that uh, – basically like didn't challenge Kathleen Kane on issuing, not taking up the case that issues marriage license and stuff like this. Um, they went ahead and endorsed Tom Wolf mm -hmm. and these uh, people, uh, especially like Zaborny in particular, uh, was really pissed off that um, these LGBT groups weren't endorsing Corbett for what Corbett supposedly like did for them. Besides, like, humiliate and mock them and, you know, come out with these racist or you know, right. transphobic and uh, homophobic um, uh, uh, statements. Right. Exactly. Exactly. It's like, hey, I came in there, like, as a gun for hire, right? And I want a little uh, quid pro quo. That was the whole idea here. And then you guys go and stab me in the back. Well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going right to the meme generator right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man.
It's like, hey man, I wasn't sitting. It's like, it's like, it's like when someone's like racist e- emails get made public. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. I was just joking. How does that even work as a phrase? Like, it's just a joke. Okay, what was funny about the joke? <laughs> right? I mean, like, what was what was the humor part of that? And what do you have to believe for that to be funny as opposed to enraging? <laughs> right? Yeah. It's like that's always the test of character that you gotta think of, but but here you go. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. Well, uh as we heard in today's uh intro. Uh, Scott Wagner was uh, also not Another- very happy about Puerto Rico <laughs> or any attention being paid to Puerto blah, Rico. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> if I'm going to offend somebody, and I'm going to offend somebody right now. <laughs> right. What I'm about to say is probably going to upset people, probably offend you. But I'm going to say it anyways. Like, there's a voice inside of me that is knocking real hard on my brain telling me not to say this, but I'm going to do it anyways. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to throw off the morality overcoat, Sean. You just can't listen to it anymore. Haven't yeah, you ever seen I... Animal House? <laughs> <laughs> not in a while. It's been a really long time. Yeah, well. I, I, need, I need a refresher on that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so uh, do you have the clip ready for Scott Wagner? So we, we could just play it again because I'm, I'm just pulling up an article. The clip right ready for Scott Wagner. Which one? I don't know. Which one are we? The, the Puerto Rico one. The Puerto Rico one. Oh, you wanted the whole thing up? No, oh, just like what, what he said. Oh, well, I got it. It's embedded in the embedded in the. Intro. OK. All right. So so no problem. So. um, So you heard you heard that in the beginning. And uh, there's a couple of like th- the reason why this is really important is because Wagner's getting crushed in the polls. Uh, he's making all these unforced errors. And now down ballot races are going to be affected by the shit he does. Mm-hmm. And Republicans are starting to get pretty pissed at that. And um, one of the Republicans is uh, who's really vulnerable to this election is appropriations chairman in the Senate, uh, Pat Brown. And Pat Brown uh, has his faults, but he's an extremely smart person. He's one of the only Republicans willing to do the stuff with the appropriations chair. And he's up there like twice a week, even in the summertime and off weeks, meeting with the staff, making sure everything with the appropriations committee is going well and just reviewing stuff with the state. Uh, He's Mm -hmm. a tax lawyer or he's an accountant. He knows how the tax system works. So he's actually like really smart on this stuff. And um, he has a progressive challenger in uh, Mark Pinsley. um, And Pat Brown's district is like a Clinton district. It went for Clinton pretty much. And um his district's also in Allentown and it's like a split between Allentown and the suburbs. And, um, you know, like the shit that Wagner says with Puerto Rico, uh, actually will affect someone like Pat Brown. Mm -hmm. And if Pat Brown loses, it would be an upset that just as big as like bright bill, who was the, um, Senate Republican leader back in 2006, losing to Fulmer in a primary. Like this is how monumental of an upset this would be. And he goes to say, uh, there are thousands of families who I represent, many citizens who have ties and families in Puerto Rico. The governor, Tom Wolf, is showing leadership by visiting Puerto Rico and surveying the damage with what happened to Maria. And um, then you have Charlie Giroux basically saying, like, I don't understand why people think that they could be like brand themselves like Trump or Trump light. So this is actually something that has gotten a lot of blowback within the commu- within within the Republican community. Yeah, especially someone like someone like Pat Brown, where you're basically saying, you know, I mean, if he could potentially sink like the, these kind of comments and that kind of campaign could potentially sink Pat Brown's reelection. Yeah, and it could sink other Republicans in the Philadelphia area and stuff like that. And, you know, we're just well, seeing. I mean, I think but Brown is really important in that regard because, I mean, like I mean, like I've said a thousand times on this podcast, I mean, really, the Lehigh Valley is the future of Pennsylvania. The Lehigh Valley is the political future of Pennsylvania. And you're at kind of tipping points all over the places we started to see in last in like um, in, the, in the last round of elections or, or um, in um, last round of uh, primaries, rather. Um, and Pat Brown. Right. You know, he's been he's had the benefit of incumbency for a long time. Right. And he hasn't been in a context in which uh, his uh, seat is really threatened in the way that it is right now. And if you basically are, are freely given 
um, you know, every reason in the book for ev- for every Democrat, especially anyone at all people of color in the Lehigh Valley to make sure that they turn out to vote, um, then Pat Brown's seat is is definitely at risk. Yeah. And, you know, if Allentown turns out to vote, uh, you're going to have a lot of straight ticket Democratic right. voters coming out. Right. And you're not going to have people splitting their ticket. Right. And this is the thing where, uh, you know, there, there, you can see some upsets. And this this is one of them that could potentially happen because and Scott Wagner is not making that any easier for him. That, that that's just an issue where Scott Wagner is becoming a detriment for the ticket. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Nuts, man. Nuts, man. Well, th- there you go. I mean, uh, here we got Wagner just throwing kind of more bullshit everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and his consultants to wipe are helping out as well. Yeah, even his consultants. Everyone in the campaign is like doing their part. <laughs> it's crazy. All right, so now we've got uh, um, some. Uh, okay, you're writing more right here about. I'm Wagner. just putting it. I'm putting a link in for the the show notes. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, cool. So, so also you got this thing in here. Uh, got the good old Koch brothers are now activating their um, their sleeper cells. Yes. Um, <laughs> there was a uh, labor and industry uh, hearing. So a um, rash of uh, anti-public sector union bills have been uh, introduced in the uh, House by your uh, anti-union Republicans. And on um, one of the newest attacks uh, launched by the, these groups is a bill that would force public state employers uh, to send notices to their employees every two weeks that they have the right to not be in a union and this bill is being pushed by um the fairness center which is the uh which is a special interest law firm that is funded or operated by the commonwealth foundation um they are funded by the commonwealth foundation matt Bray was on their board uh charles mitchell the current president of the commonwealth foundation is on their board um they do nothing but file frivolous lawsuits against public sector unions and try to like muck up muck them up inside the court system uh, you had Americans for Prosperity uh, testifying on this on behalf of this. And then you also had uh, Americans for Fair Treatment, which is another Commonwealth front group um, that is sole purpose is to get um, public sector or fair share members to drop out of their union. Yeah, and we told you this was coming. Yes. And this is this is. Uh, and um, so what the unions were saying, what, especially what Steve Katniss from 668 was saying, that this is just nothing but uh, harassment and a coercive, and it, it goes against fair labor practices. Um, this section of the hearing, when um, these three people up were up there from these uh, Koch brother groups, uh, turned to an absolute just shit show. It had nothing to do with the, the bill itself. But um, Democrats like uh, Leanne kruger uh Galloway, the committee co-chair, and Ed Nielsen um, from Northeast Philly, who are those two are pretty much moderate um, labor Democrats uh, who are not really there on the pro-life stuff or who are there not on the pro-choice stuff, but are there on the workers issues. Uh, They were basically like grilling them, like saying, who's your funders? And it was like, "Uh, like, like, are you connected with the Commonwealth Foundation or connected with the Koch brothers? Um, And basically no one got them to admit, like it was just, pinning them down with this stuff, which is good to see. Yeah, that's awesome to see. It's like there's Um, there's some steel going around all over the place then. Yeah. Crazy, man. (laughs) Crazy. Well, keep an eye out for this. So we should be, you know, again... Uh, I've, as I was saying to you before uh, we went to record today, is that I'm surprised that I haven't gotten anything um, yet, actually, from uh, to try to kind of push me to, uh, you know, disown my union, which is, you know, that's like when hell freezes over, folks, just so you know. Uh, the interesting thing is, though, I, I have like been- this Americans for Fair Treatment stuff, like the, the, the group that's doing this is a really small group. It's maybe like staffed by like one person and a couple of interns. Oh yeah, but that group, like group, that group for there, their I mean, their their only purpose is to do exactly what they just did. Yeah, right. That's it. Right. They don't need any kind of like long sustained plan. They've got kind of unlike you know unfettered cash flow, so um, they're going to be all set. Yeah. Crazy man. So you know, and the other thing, uh, well, anything else on the Wagner front this week? No. <laughs> no okay. This week in Wagner. <laughs> yeah, this week in Wagner. But uh, uh, but speaking of, like, you know, other people that uh, we haven't heard from for a while, Dale Leach is back in the news. 
Uh, and uh, is he trying to like redeem himself in a very strange way this week, Sean? Um, I guess so. <laughs> I think I, he he, um, he attacked a um, rape survivor who's also running for the Senate on uh, Katie Muth uh, because she did not want to uh, sit on a panel with him. And the Philly Clout published a story. Um, uh, actually, so Dalen's been uh, work pretty much like campaigning on behalf of uh, Rafferty up in uh, Philadelphia suburbs. Uh, we Rafferty was someone who uh, was one of Trump's early supporters in Pennsylvania, stood on the stage with Trump during the primary. Uh, when he was here in Pennsylvania. Um, and we just kind of been like uh, supporting Rafferty because Katie Muth called on Dalen to resign back when the stuff came out against Dalen back in December. And um, Dalen's been, uh, you know, so, um, so just to read a quick part of this. Um, so um, there was this thing going on at the high school, which Dalen Leach's daughter sits at with Democratic Club. And Katie Muth called, and said, like, listen, I'm, I don't want to be a part of this uh, since Dalen's here. And Dalen Leach was dropped. So pick it up from the Clout article. Um, it said, shortly thereafter, Leach fired off an angry email to Joe Foster, uh, chairman of the Montgomery County's Democratic Party. He called Muth a dreadful person and a toxic can grenade. Le- Leach told Foster in an August 25th email that he had held up his end of the bargain and played nice. He hadn't said anything negative about Muth or donors or voters he wrote. Uh, Leach also claimed that uh, Muth soon would be irrelevant to our lives while he would be a senator fighting for progressive issues for many years to come. Um, Our truce is over, Leach proclaimed. I will do all I can uh, to make sure people know. It's unbelievable. I mean, so, you know, he's got, you know, was it? Uh, 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 a, a wrecking ball of hate, right? That was his uh, his last round, right? Yeah, against one of the people we know. He called out um, a couple of people by name in his statement who accused him of this stuff. And now he wants to go <clears throat> attacking progressive uh, females in the state. Yeah, with similar kind of language, right? So I'm one, the, the one, the one, you know, this... You know, freaking sorry to Katie Muth. I'm not sorry to like a, what anything to do with that, but I mean, what the hell? I mean, she's got to kind of be the subject of this stuff um, after everything else that has gone on. Uh, but you know, he's basically showing everybody establishing his pattern, right? Um, you know, so if you wanted to kind of hide behind that, he's not being able to do, you know, this, oh, this is somebody, this is wrecking ball is what did this. You know, here he goes again, flying off doing virtually the identical thing, right? In a similar kind of scenario. So, you know what? <laughs> so, all you kind of Dale and Lee supporters out there, like, wh- what you holding on to, right? Because uh, the life raft itself is coming apart at this point. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he says he's going to be up there for many years to come. That might end in 2020 when he's up for a primary challenge. And I guarantee you he will be getting primaried by someone. <laughs> Sean Kitchen 2020. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no all right well um the other thing this is just kind of more uh, of a follow-up to the a previous kind of explosive story that came out of the attorney general's office here um uh, uh a couple of weeks ago now i guess uh about the um catholic church right and the uh sexual abuse by priests right that explosive report that came out um that it had been a long time coming and basically show them the, the degree of corruption of the entire church infrastructure, right? In addition to kind of like 300 priests, right? Implicated in this, uh, thousands of, uh, of, of, of kids um, victimized um, by these priests and then the cover up that went along with it. Um, now, this has spawned kind of this like rolling um, series of investigations now. And so uh, this week we also had the announcements from um, um, New York State. Right. Uh, and from uh, New Jersey, um, they just kind of kind of together or in synchronized, we should say. Um, and now they will start their own uh, round of um, investigations. And I have to say that, you know, I'm I'm especially interested in, in um, the New York investigation because there were always talk about, you know, certain priests where I grew up. Right? So I grew up Catholic. Right. So I went to Catholic Church. And um, there are always these talk about certain priests and, you know, like like it always happens. And this is why I got so disgusted with the church was because and the, the whole infrastructure, because people would talk about it. And it seemed that people, some people knew about it, but then they would never act on it. Right. So you'd hear everything third and fourth hand. And so, you know, the reckoning is here. 
And uh, I just hope that this ball keeps on rolling, right? Because I'll tell you, there's a lot of, you know, I, I know a ton of really good people in the Catholic Church, right, um, that are there for the good works, that are there for actually following through on the, you know, um, kind of working with the poor and doing that stuff. Um, but for me, the uh, the Catholic Church infrastructure and the hierarchy is rotten to the core. And, and told that completely gets wiped away. Um, you know, I, it, there's it's, it's always going to be stained and it's always going to be problematic and you're never going to see me around there. But I just have to say that. Um, that's cool. Last thing I got today is uh, Lytle Hall, my workplace, right in my own backyard. Yes, indeed, once again, the mold refused its eviction notice, right? Or I should put it this way, it refused to go away simply because the administration says the problem's done, right? So if you recall that uh, Lytle Hall has had all sorts of mold issues, has all sorts of health problems, right? The Pennsylvania Department of Labor Industry has come in and cited the university for, um, uh, uh, for all sorts of violations of health codes in Lytle Hall. They were forced to go back in and actually do repairs. And once again, yet again, those repairs have not taken Right. So last year, a couple million dollars they spent on kind of redoing these all this HVAC system. Right. And that was a catastrophe. Right. Um, that, you know, I won't rehash it, but that was a catastrophe. Right. It worked eventually a little bit. But then you guess what happened? Another summer came and it got humid again and the mold came back. Right. And so once again, there was black mold up on uh, ceiling tiles, which I think we talked about last week. Um, ceiling tiles once again in this printer room. And uh, then finally, after we were kind of like, talking about it on this podcast, sending pictures on social media about what this actually looked like, um, they came in to fix it. And really what the fix it was is they just came in with a little bleach to wipe off the tile so you couldn't see it. <laughs> right. Uh, it still reeks in that room of mold. Well, this week. Right. Sure enough, there's more like uh, water damage that is appearing on more and more of these tiles. So either the roof wasn't fixed properly. Right. Or there's now an additional problem of condensation um, that didn't exist before because they're they're just kind of like MacGyvering their uh, HVAC systems in this building, the building that should be just taken down. Um, and uh, faculty members were told that, you know, what what's going on over there in that building? You know, the, the, the provost, the administration, they don't know anything about this. Right. So I'm sitting there in my office. Right. Um, after I had gotten through all my sneezing fits for the day after once I arrived on campus and Mike Gambone, who you've heard me talk about before on this podcast, he's a history department um, faculty member and also is uh, a uh, mold hunting enthusiast, um, basically shows up at my office door. Uh, and he's got uh, like uh, about three, four or five ceiling tiles. <laughs> right? He's basically said he brought his ladder in once again. Right. Carrying his ladder around saying brought in these ceiling tiles with these big. Bring stones. out your mold. Yeah, bring out your mold. <laughs> bring out your mold. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And he said, like, well, OK, look, you know, the administration says that they don't know anything about this. So um, we want to make sure that they know about this. So we sat there. I had a bunch of Sharpies in my office and labeled, Mike labeled the, um, each one, which room it came from and so on. And he walked them over the administration <laughs> saying, just so you know, this is the reminder, right? Because obviously email and the work order systems and basic human decency is not working. So uh, we're actually going to leave these in your office, right? Which has spawned now a bunch of other things. Now there's other people saying like, hey, I can't move into that office because there's missing ceiling tiles in there, <laughs> Right. And this is kind of what you got to do. And it's an absolute shame that this has got to go on. But the reason I bring this up and the reason I'm staying on this story is, one, obviously, I've got a personal investment in this because I can smell the mold, right? And I can feel the health impacts on a daily basis, right? But now there's actually some faculty members that are, are actually considering trying to get the heck out of that building, right? But also say this is really what it takes. This is the kind of persistence um, of against bad actors, Right. And, you know, again, this is the difference between saying we're going to follow your practices and what you do, not what you say. Right. I might get along with you perfectly well in normal circumstances. Right. But as long as you're the person that's standing in the way of, of making my workplace healthy, then, you know, I don't want the hell to tell you. You can take all your kind of like, you know, social niceties and put them in your pocket. That's one way of saying it. Right. So here we go. So Mike Gambo, once again, thank you, Mike for uh uh being such a a uh you know really a, a 
amazing mold hunter. Really, you are. I mean, you're going to earn all sorts of badges and stuff, right? Look like big black mold splotches on your shirt. So cool. So that's the latest from Lytle, from Lytle Hall and the, uh, the e- eternal battle against the mold and an administration that could care less about people that they are don't prioritize. So, <laughs> you know, it sucks to be one of them, I guess, for me. Um, but there you have it. So, Sean, anything else in the, kind of the, the PA fun? No, I'm just watching the fallout on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> you can so, tell. Uh, so John Fetterman is weighed in. Oh, yeah. More class. Fetterman. <laughs> uh, more class from the Scott Wagner team mocking the LGBTQ com- community. Very mavericky, Ray the Maverick. <laughs> but it's. Yeah, but it's. <laughs> oh man oh man i'm just gonna wait for uh you know i'm just gonna start waiting for someone on uh um wagner's team to get caught flashing the white power sign that's what i'm waiting for <laughs> <laughs> i mean they do dress up like hitler youth and they do the children yeah so <laughs> They do. And I, you know, I do understand that Wagner was kind of, you know, was pissed when he found out um, after this this uh, segment from uh, or not this segment after this story got published in, in Billy Penn. And he was heard saying something along the lines. I don't know, something like this. That's why I prefer <laughs> to understand us I prefer <laughs> the city. <laughs> I'm smart enough to, you know, form my own opinions. There you go. <laughs> Good old. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> right, 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 right. I can't believe I didn't cut that part of it, but um, so I'll have to go back and do it. Anyways, this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. We're going to be back in just a minute with today's last call. As Sean gets to kind of like, uh, through secondhand, secondhand smoke, so to speak, <laughs> get exposed to Star Trek. What? What's going on? We'll be back right after this break. We want to remind you, support Raging Chicken Press and alternative media in the state. We'll be right back. <laughs> This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. For the past seven years, Raging Chicken Press has brought pull-no-punches, progressive reporting and commentary to the interwebs. Our long-form investigative pieces, stories that no access journalist wants to touch, or rollicking weekly podcasts strive to advance progressive movements and perspectives rooted in the struggles happening across the country or down the street. We've broken national stories and caused our share of discomfort in the halls of power. If we want a progressive future, we need progressive media. And you can help support Pull No Punches, homegrown progressive media today. Become a member of Raging Chicken Press for as little as $5 a month. Simply go to patreon.com slash rcpress and choose your membership level. We need to make sure to keep the movement in the media and the media in the movement. Best way you can do that is to become a member of Raging Chicken today by going to patreon.com slash rcpress. Thank you for your energy, your encouragement, and your support. Keep up the fight. There are 24 decks, almost 700 meters long. It took me six months to scrounge up enough titanium just to build a four-meter cockpit. How much did this thing cost? The economics of the future are somewhat different. You see, money doesn't exist in the 24th century. No money? The acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives. We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. There you go, folks. That is Captain Jean-Luc Picard, right, from the uh, of Star Trek movie. So, Sean, 
that is Picard. That is one of my favorite statements from Picard from the um, um, from the first Next Generation movie, uh, where he's explaining what this new economy is like in the future. Now, if you recall, a few weeks back, I didn't have the sound pulled for it, and there was kind of a bunch of reasons for that. Um, but uh, my, you know, what we my fascination has always been in science fiction. I, I am totally on the Star Trek um, um, bandwagon, have been for a long, long time. And uh, I just uh, thought it was interesting. It was a couple weeks ago that, uh, well, first of all, Sean has never seen Star Trek, right? And nope. uh, he he just doesn't care about science fiction, and he thinks it's irrelevant. And any talk talk of space and all this kind of stuff makes him like just like like turn to Twitter and go off in the other world. So, but I wanted to get, provide at least a, like an introductory, there he goes, <laughs> introductory lesson to Star Trek for you, Sean. And I know you're going to do your absolute best to uh, avoid even hearing what I'm going to say, but so I've tried to kind of put together this little piece that is, uh, that hopefully will, will draw you in and show it's not just me, right? So Corey Pine, right, um, was on um, uh, the Majority Report a couple weeks ago. Right. Oh, Michael Brooks was hosting on a Friday and um, they were talking about Corey Pine's book, um, which I think is called Work, 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 Death or something like this. And it's about Silicon Valley and, and kind of um, unpacking it. And they're talking specifically about Elon Musk and uh, Peter Thiel. Right. And then uh, they turn to a discussion. Right? It starts with just a comment and a little kind of short discussion of Star Trek. Right. And Star Wars, but in Star Trek. Right. So, Sean, I'm just going to say I'm just going to put this out there for you just as a way to say this is why it's relevant for our discussion. So this is a little snippet from the discussion for Corey Pine and Michael Brooks. Uh, and um, you heard Jamie kind of come in uh, a little bit there, too, as well. But uh, just take a listen. <laughs> uh, you know, there was a joke because uh, Musk and Teal used to be business partners at PayPal back right. in the first dot com bubble. And um they used to. I think Teal has even written about this in, in one of his business books. But uh, they used to have sort of a pop quiz uh, about whether you were a, a Star Wars person or a Star Trek person. And I oh think. Oh my God, Jesus the, Christ! The, Just the, listen uh, to but, the people but, but, that are but, running but, our world. I'm serious. Yeah, no. Oh. It's, uh, uh, but you know, the, the main reason that I think they were both Star Wars people is because Star Trek depicted uh, like some kind of socialist, uh, you know, future. Uh, yeah, dude. Confederation and Star Wars is more of a like anarchic uh, libertarian paradise. Wait, Star, Star Trek... Wars was libertarian in in their minds anyway. Oh. Star Trek is a Posadist show. My producer Andy actually wrote a great article about that for the New York Times. I only know that Star Trek is socialisty because of Peter Fraser's Four Futures book. Wasn't and he does an amazing breakdown actually of. Yes, Star Trek really is a healthy example of a socialized society that's dedicated to human flourishing and exploration. It was actually fascinating to read. There you go, Sean. There's my pitch, man. Star Trek, <laughs> right there. Right? And the, Four Futures, by the way, is written the Peter Fraser book. It's a Jacobin book, right? So it's a Jacobin book that one of the um, uh, Jacobin magazine had published as part of its publishing house. And uh, there you go. Uh, Star Trek, right? We need the imaginary to kind of begin to even imagine what something like this would look like. And Star Trek is an example. Case rested, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> You're 100% sold, right? Right? <laughs> yeah, of course. I'll, 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 I, I will. <clears throat> I will. Um, I will binge that on Netflix, as they say. Just the, cur the current <laughs> vernacular. <laughs> These days. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I love it. Um, uh, well, that, that movie, which I'm trying to remember the, uh, the which one, that which the name of that movie that's coming from, but I'm just going to um, – I'll get that to you and we'll talk about it another time. But what is interesting, the first – the very first academic paper that I ever wrote, right, that got accepted for a conference that I, that I presented um, was on Star Trek, right? Um, and it was called um, – what Star Trek, the next, well, how was it? Uh, yeah, the Star Trek, the next generation, the galaxy class of galactic capitalism, I think is what it called, right? Galaxy class is the class of the starship in the next generation, right? So there's these different classes of, you know, just like you'd have different years and different models. And so the galaxy class and my argument in that and why this matters for here is, is this also comes up in this, um, in this movie in a way that kind of, I, I would argue at least, proved my point right uh, about what the borg were 
so the Borg, if you've never watched Star Trek before, the Borg were these kind of like cyborg creatures, right? And the whole mantra behind the Borg was like, you know, uh, we are the Borg, resistance is futile, you will be assimilated. And they would take over, um, you know, civilization after civilization and then kind of integrate them into the hive mind, right? Um, now, that was the Borg came out in the actual series of The Next Generation in Star Trek. And um, there were people that I used to have these arguments with people um, when I was I think it was in college when this was all happening um, about what the Borg were. Right. So there there's folks who say, oh, they, they would hate the move that Star Trek made because they would say that what the Borg represented was like communists, like right? the communism. Everyone's the same. The cogs in the machine. Um, but I was like, no, 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 you've got this all backwards. Right. You're thinking about what's happening here is that the Borg were introduced at a time when the c- communism was on the was on the slide out. And what the Borg represented was the corporate capitalist infrastructure about turning everyone into these cogs. Right. And so my argument was that it was not like a regressive right way, back looking way of kind of um, looking at um, what communism and kind of like jumping on the kind of the red scare and the red baiting stuff. No, it was actually shifting. uh, There was a space finally to actually shift and see what this is doing, what capitalism, unfettered capitalism is doing to all of us. And then you see when the first movie of the next generation comes out, you have this instance where Picard is actively discussing um, this uh, this future. Right. And it is one where capitalism no longer exists. Right. And also in the next generation, there's a there's a um, I think it's a way mission or I can't remember the, the title of it. But there's an episode explicitly where you have a um, these this one group of people that they're encountering that are basically the libertarian fringe. Right. They are the Peter Thiel's, the Elon Musk, these libertarian fringe about unfettered accumulation of capital. And I want just nothing. And it's all about me. Right. And then Picard is arguing, not just Picard, but Picard is specifically arguing back and they're having this ideological battle right, over um, kind of the right way of kind of constructing a society. Right. And it's not completely resolved in the episode, which is kind of cool. But what you get to see is, is that, again, how many spaces do you see when in popular culture where you get to see a real argument being being had over a socialistic future? Right. I mean, it just it just it's just amazing. So there's my pitch for the next generation, Sean. And uh, um, and you can watch it with beer. It's OK. Right. So uh, um, have at it. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I actually watched uh, something really interesting on Netflix over the weekend. Oh, what was it? Uh, Get me Roger Stone. Oh, yeah. You mentioned this. Yes. Uh, I did not realize how powerful Roger Stone was. It, in the um, conservative movement, like I knew he would always operate within the shadows of the movement as mm-hmm. of recently, but I didn't realize that guy was like senior advisors to like presidential campaigns and all. Yeah. Like I knew he was part of Black Man of Fort and Stone, but like <clears throat> the, uh, yeah, it, it was just, it was a really good documentary. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's amazing how Trump. Sounds exactly like the same person he did so he fucking built a mobile. 20, 30 yeah, right? years ago. Right. Like not a goddamn thing has changed. Yep. And it has like a lot. Of, yeah. So that, 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 that's what I thought was really good. Cool, man. Uh, the uh, by the way, the, the, that episode from Star Trek Next Generation that you should watch if you're going to watch it, it's called The Neutral Zone. Mm-hmm. Right. And I recommend it to anybody there out to see this example of kind of, you know, confronting the libertarian with a kind of socialist future. But anyways, but yeah. And watch. Uh, get Rogers. So I haven't seen that yet. And so this is actually putting it's going to have to kind of tick it back up to the top of my list because uh, I've been wanting to watch that for a while. Cool. 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 Well, uh, I've got my little uh, update from Free Will. Free Will has got a double can release tomorrow and that will be Saturday, September 8th. Um, but if you miss the release tomorrow, um, they'll probably have some for uh, for a few days after that, at least. It's on at both locations. And this is the first time that they've ever um, produced either one of these beers. So that's kind of exciting. And they're going to be in 16-ounce um, uh, four-packs um, that will be available for purchase, but they'll also be on tap. So the two beers are here, and I'll give you their, their descriptions on them if you're kind of in the Percocet PA area. Um, so the first one is called Brute, right? And Brute means dry right so it's a hoppy this is their description is the hoppy existence of an ipa that drinks with the finesse of a bright dry bubbly champagne and burst forward with pops of delicious hops effervescent pale and super aromatic we fermented this beer down to be virtually bone dry and hopped it with copious amounts of vic secret and galaxy 
Prominent notes of tropical fruit, pineapple, and green banana dance across the tongue before finishing with a refreshing crispness. Um, so there's that. That's Brut. And the other one is Pink Guava Muse. And this is the one I think I'm kind of even more interested in in some ways. Um, so here's their description again. It was brewed with oats and milk sugar and conditioned on pink guava fruit. Inspired by a trip to the islands, this is the next installment of our Muse series. Lavishly tropical with a soft sweetness and a tinge of tartness. This beer is the perfect way to hold on to the last days of summer where science meets art and creativity is just as necessary as discipline. And that's where you'll find us dreaming of our next creation. Um, and I, I, I'm more into that one in part because actually what they have in there in the description, like, it seems like this is like one of the last opportunities to have a summer beer, right? And as while well, the heat's still holding on before we head into the fall uh, full blown. So um, those are available at Free Will. Um, so check them out if you want to. I'm going to go pick some up tomorrow. Um, I did have, if you remember last week, I uh, was talking about um, Freshy and uh, the Cloudy with a Chance of Pepperoni. Um, Sean was in town, and I did hand off the uh, uh, the beer to Sean that I got for him. Sean, and you said that you, you, you had some tastes. You had some taste. You drank some of it. I liked them both. I thought yeah. they were really good. Um, I've been liking the beers that uh, Free Will has been putting out lately. Um, it was actually really funny. I was at the bar last night uh, before the Eagles game to get a happy hour beer in. Um, <laughs> and they had the uh, county line I, county, yeah, county, county line IPA on from the Chamonix Creek. Mm-hmm. And that's just a really like piney, bitter, yep. Yep, yep. maltier IPA. And it's amazing how much my taste buds has changed over the past year mm-hmm. with like the newer IPAs coming out, like those New England styles or like your West Coast styles where they just like massively dry hop the beers at the end of the yeah. process which gives it like more of a fruitier taste it brings out more of like the taste of the hops than like the bitterness of the hops yep and um it's amazing how much my taste has changed over the past year because now i used to love those bitter ipas all the time but now it's like i could i had to muscle it down that's why we should we should say too that's a good beer too right yeah i mean so it's like you know it's kind of interesting when that happens and you think it's just just kind of like just from drinking the other stuff for a while um i think it's more or less from or, yeah i mean because it's it, it's the trend of the beers so like new the latest trend is to uh massively dry hop the beers at the end because that brings out more of like the fruitiness of the of the hops than like the pininess if you put right, the right. hops in the beginning of the brewing stage that's where you get your bittering hops in the stuff you put at the end gives you more of your flavors um and now the 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 trend is just put all the hops in at like be, after the boil is done pretty much mm-hmm. and just massively dry hop it. And yeah, so uh, no, it, it's definitely the taste is changing. Uh, palates are changing all the time. And, you know, it, it's amazing to see how the industry can change people's palates yeah. as they are experimenting with new stuff. Yeah, it's cool. And I think that, you know, I, I agree. That I, I love the stuff that's coming out of free will. I mean, they've got Nate, who's one of the guys who's uh, works on their sour stuff was brought in to help with their sour stuff is, uh, you know, his, his, his daughter's in, uh, in school with my daughter, right, the same grade. And um, um, he's over there. And he said that, you know, I remember I was, when I was talking to him last fall when he was really, you know, first his stuff was kind of coming forward. He's actually working on a whole bunch of new stuff. And he just said, he just said, hey, you, uh, he says, just wait to see what we've got coming. Right. Uh, so we got some kind of really cool stuff coming out. Right. So um, cool on them, man. I mean, I, I've just been always impressed with Free Will in terms of their uh, just just in terms of their consistent and increasing quality. Right. I mean, they, and they'll try new stuff um, and then they refine it and they come back and it's and it's better. Um, so, hey, man, have at it. Yeah. Not cool. So anything else uh, kind of going on? Cool stuff for the weekend or anything? No, no. I think I'm going to go bother Roxbury for a little bit over this. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the porch sit. You're going to do the porch sit is what you're going to tell me. Yes. <laughs> Wait for the, drain, the brain trust to walk by. <laughs> oh, yeah. Start cackling at them when they're uh... – <laughs> yeah. I really think they're going to just like snap on me one day when they see me in public. Like yeah. it's. Yeah, it's getting I, to that. It's getting to that point. Yeah, I really think that if you're going to sit out there, if the, especially if the if uh, Wagner's people and the Brain Trust people uh, walk by every once in a while, there, you guys should really have uh, several cans of Silly String, right? Right there, because <laughs> I think that would be freaking awesome. <laughs> Probably get you a little arrested or something too. But that's it. <laughs> cool. All right, man. Anything else for the good of the order? No, that's it. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it. All right. Well, congratulations to the Eagles. Uh, 
Uh, Sean, I'm, I was happy to be here for introduction to uh, Starfleet Economics. And um, uh, here we go. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. We want to remind everybody to become a member of Raging Chicken Press for as little as five bucks a month. Just go to patreon.com slash rcpress and become a member today. Until next week, here we go. See ya! You know, listen, I'm, I'm running for governor. I'm not trying to be politically correct, and I won't be politically correct, but I'm about ready to say something that is going to maybe offend some people. But if I offend you, so what? Because there are municipalities that are struggling. The governor going to Puerto Rico is pure bullshit, okay? Bullshit. <laughs>